Um, so to begin, uh, Paul and Tom, could you briefly describe your background, your area of expertise, and what are your interests in U.S. foreign policy regarding Europe? Sure, no. Is this working? Yes. Okay. Uh, no, great. Uh, th thank you, David. Uh, Tom Sheehy, I uh, have been uh, privileged to be associated with Ed Royce for, for 23 years on the committee, so I served <coughs> on the House Committee on Foreign Affairs, uh, and the, uh, Ed Royce was chairman of several different subcommittees, and, and I was the staff director. So when, he first, uh, when I first arrived in, in, in Congress and working for him, he became chairman of the Africa Subcommittee, and we did that work for eight years and, and did a lot of good bipartisan work. And then he took over a subcommittee called Terrorism, Nonproliferation, and Trade, and he chaired that for eight years, and so I was the staff director and, and covered a lot of interesting issues. And then he became full committee chairman for six years, and, and so my job was running the committee. I, I'm not sure I see Amy in the room quite yet, but uh, uh, the two of us uh, uh, were in charge of his uh, Washington operations, myself on the committee, and, and we had a pretty good run of six years. We worked in a very bipartisan way. We passed over 80 bills into law signed by the president dealing with a full range of issues from Africa trade to uh, promoting women in development, conservation, uh, energy, the BUILD Act, which uh, the chairman mentioned to increase the size of the Development Finance Corporation. And so I left Congress four years ago when he retired. I'm now a part-time fellow at the U.S. Institute of Peace, which is a uh, nonpartisan U.S. government-supported institution that does research and also does programs for the State Department and USAID. I'm focused on uh, Africa, particularly China and Africa. I also have a consulting company and, and do work with a lot of businesses that are trying to compete against China in Africa, for example, and uh, work with a, a couple other nonprofit uh, organizations. So stay very involved in, in foreign policy. All right, thanks. So I'm Paul Denieri, I'm from UC Riverside. I'm a political scientist. Thanks for the invitation. I very much appreciate being here. Um, I've been studying Russia-Ukrainian relations for, I'm afraid to say, just over 30 years now. When the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991, I had just finished a PhD dissertation and I was looking around for a new research topic since mine had ceased to exist. Um, and I thought, <laughs> what's going to happen between these two big countries that are coming out of the Soviet Union, Russia and Ukraine? And so I started studying it. Um, the, the, the long, the long drawn-out result of that, among other things, has been a book called Ukraine and Russia from Civilized Divorce, Uncivil War, uh, the updated edition through August of 2022, of which is uh, due out next week from Cambridge University Press. Um, so there's my plug. Um, I lived for, uh, in Ukraine for a year back in the early 90s, um, have been back more times than I can count since, um, spent some time in Russia, spent some time at NATO headquarters and EU headquarters in Brussels, but always with this focus on Russia and Ukraine and what that means more broadly for European security uh, and for the United States. Um, I should say I've taught now at the, uh, I've been at Riverside since 2014, before that I was at the University of Florida. And before that, I was uh, for a long time at the University of Kansas. Um, and especially at Kansas, I did a lot of work with the US Army up at Fort Leavenworth, um, largely with the Command and General Staff College, but also with the School of Advanced Military Studies, um, the Foreign Military Studies Office, and some other things. Um, and, I, and I do a bunch of stuff. We were just talking about best ways to get back and forth to Washington. I do a bunch of stuff uh, with the government in Washington as well. So my interest in U.S. foreign policy are in Europe have focused very much on U.S. policy towards Ukraine and Russia and on how Europe and the United States, the North American community, deals with the changes that are the challenges that, that come from that relationship. All right. Um, so the first question I have um, for, and you can both weigh in um, at, any, uh, at any point. Um, how would you characterize the state of European geopolitics um, regarding the Russian war in Ukraine? What's the significance of the war for Europe and for the wider world? And what are Putin's objectives and what sort of implications do they have for European security? All right. Go ahead, David. Sure, sure. Uh, sorry, um, that's not David. Quite a <laughs> roaming uh, question, but... Uh, I'm going to start, uh, I mentioned just our congressional career, and so when uh, we first uh, took over this, or got involved in, in some of the 
activities on the committee, it was right after 9-11. And that very much caught everyone by shock, surprise. I remember being up in Congress running around, members of Congress were asking, who's Osama bin Laden? Uh, it, it really came out of the dark. And, uh, and so that defined our foreign policy for really up until uh, Ed Royce left Congress. Uh, the, the idea of trying to work in ungoverned spaces to challenge the, the terrorist threat, whether it be Afghanistan, Iraq, and so forth. Uh, obviously, that's changed a great deal now. And while I think those threats still very much exist, and I see Hassan Nouri in Afghanistan, I, I have to acknowledge that. While I think those terrorist threats still very much exist, as uh, Ed Royce suggested, we're very much now into an area of great power competition. And, and we're seeing this play out with Ukraine, and uh, as, as he mentioned, the relationship between China and Russia and Iran, with Iran being a major backer of, of uh, the Russian invasion supplying drones, and North Korea with artillery. And so, uh, unfortunately, it's, it's moving into an era where the U.S. and our Western allies are now confronting very aggressive, uh, very aggressive states, and the challenges are are almost daunting, frankly. I mean, if you everyone were focused and we're discussing here Ukraine, but we have a challenge with China, we have Taiwan, we have North Korea, we have Iran, and so that's that's the big uh, geopolitical uh, uh, picture. I would add, you know, I. I'm sitting next to two academics, so, so I'm going to mention it. In my own grad school uh, career, I did my thesis on the balance of power. And uh, you probably know Hans Morgenthau, mm -hmm. who, who was a great theoretician. Mm -hmm. He was a German emigre refugee out of, out of World War II, escaped with his life from the Holocaust. And he was very much steeped in the European, looking at countries as monarchies and, and how they have unfortunately fought many wars over the centuries and viewed balancing of power is, is important. You look at a country's national power, how, what the size of the military, the economy, what alliances would create, it would create in order to maintain stability. Well, uh, we have a balance of power now going on. We have very powerful states, but I would just, uh, the big criticism of Morgenthau was he didn't look at soft power. He didn't look at the ideas that matter. And so, uh, as Ed was saying, uh, Chinese, a whole different uh, philosophy towards governance, uh, understanding of human rights, understanding of democracy, and freedom of expression, all these things. And so that's layered on to, to a very complex world where not only is the U.S. the, the largest economy in the world and China number two, uh, we also have dramatically different systems and Russia has a dramatically different system. And they are not uh, in, a, in alignment w in whatsoever. They're in violent opposition, well, hopefully not violent, but certainly violent in Ukraine, because I do think uh, Ukraine is a bit of a proxy for, I, we can get into Putin's motives, but I'm convinced Putin is interested in Ukrainian territory. He's also interested in, in extinguishing any chance that Russia would ever adopt the, the kind of values and about democracy, freedom. Uh, so it, it's a complicated world and uh, uh, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Good, thank you. Um, so I'll begin with uh, you, you, you know, the question of, of what motivates Putin, and of course we don't, we don't exactly know, but the big point I would make is that, is that um, you know, European geopolitics is at the most perilous state it's been in many decades, including at least the last half of the Cold War, um, and maybe going back to 1945 when World War II ended, which is that's the last time we've seen you know, this kind of violence. Um, in Europe, and, and since World War II, even at the height of the Cold War, there was something that everybody more or less agreed to, which is we're not gonna resolve this with tanks and, and soldiers because, we, because we've seen where that leads and it's not good. Um, and we're not gonna change borders by force. We're gonna argue about them, we're gonna have standoffs, we're gonna point missiles at each other, but we're not doing this by force. Uh, and that's gone now. Um, one of the really big questions, I think, that then shapes ge European geopolitics for the coming years is, um, is, is what Russia's objectives are. Um, and I want to say Russia's objectives because I'm not one of those who's convinced that when Putin dies, Russia suddenly becomes a Jeffersonian democracy and, and a peaceful neighbor to everybody. Um, you know, we thought he wanted influence in Ukraine. Okay, so, well, we got to push back against that or, okay. Then he seized Crimea in 2014, and we thought, okay, he wants Crimea. We, 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 get, we don't like it, but we get it. 
Uh, then he attacked eastern Ukraine in 2014, and we thought, wow, well, that kind of surprised us. We didn't see that coming, but uh, uh, now he says he's got to have all of Ukraine. Um, and of course, has launched this massive, violent battle. And not, not only that he's got to get all of Ukraine, but he wants to extinguish the entire notion of Ukrainian nationhood. Um, and of course, he's also intervened in Georgia and Moldova. We tend not to talk much about Moldova, but if you want to get a sense of Russians' aspirations, go read something about Russia and Moldova since the early 90s. Um, and so on and so forth. And of course, now there's talk about we're going to overturn the entire Russian liberal order. And the most, uh, I shouldn't say the most recent, but you know, last summer he talked about restoring uh, R Russia to its imperial boundaries, which go look at that map. You didn't have the map of Russia in 1914, but it, it includes Warsaw, right? Mm. Um, and Finland. And, Finland. and, and so, um, so, so we don't know exactly where he would stop. Um, I think there's a good case to be made, not only for Putin himself, but throughout the last 500 years of Russian history, that Russia's western border tends to be located wherever it runs into something that it can't conquer. Um, and it's actually ebbed and flowed over the years. I, I should just point out, Russia's western border, or the Soviet Union, or the Russian Empire, has never been fixed for about more than 50 years in a stretch. The period from 1946 till 1991 is basically the longest period in history that Russia's western border has stayed in the same place. Um, so that's what we have to look forward to. Um, the implication being, to connect back with, uh, with perhaps Morgenthau, is that I expect European geopolitics in the future is going to look a lot more like it did in the past, which is insecurity is going to be the norm uh, rather than us taking security for granted as we did for several decades. Um, I think the interesting questions, just to maybe wind up, are uh, does European unity in the face of this last or does it not last? I think the United States has a huge role to play there. Um, if Russia can vanquish Ukraine, uh, where does it go next? If Russia can't vanquish Ukraine, where does it go next? Um, and we'll see. So I'll, I'll stop there. Super right. optimistic, in other words. All right. Uh, well, to inject a little bit of um, American domestic politics into this discussion of foreign policy, um, last year, soon after the Russian invasion, uh, J.D. Vance, uh, the soon-to-be U.S. Senator from Ohio, said, quote, I don't really care what happens to Ukraine one way or the other. More recently, Florida Governor and Republican Presidential Hopeful, this is me saying it, not him, uh, Ron <laughs> uh, not and. Yeah, okay, I'll leave it there. Ron DeSantis said uh, that while the U.S. has many vital national interests, becoming further entangled in the territorial dispute between Ukraine and Russia is not one of them. Um, so as a bit of personal background, I was born in 1981 with Ronald Reagan at the helm. So for me, hearing comments like this coming from Republicans um, is notable given the traditionally sort of internationalist approach of the Republican Party uh, to U.S. foreign policy. So here I have two questions. First, what are the U.S. interests in making sure that Ukraine prevails in this conflict? And second, what's the source of skepticism towards supporting Ukraine, uh, particularly amongst Republicans? I'm gonna, I'll start by discussing the national interest. And going back to the, the balance of power and, and how we define power, economic power, uh, territory, uh, so forth, access to strategic trade routes and, and, and so forth. Ukraine probably does, isn't at the top of the list. Uh, but what I would argue is that Ukraine is extremely important if we're going to defend a world order that, uh, Paul, to your point, that honors territorial integrity, the rule of law, uh, those critical values. And right now we're seeing a situation where China doesn't want any respect for territorial integrity or the rule of law. They, they've got a dispute with Taiwan. They, they would love to see that norm be chipped away. And in fact, as I mentioned soft power, Chinese diplomacy has been driven for the last 50 years in terms of, um, maybe not 50, but certainly the last 20 years, undermining the US leadership in the world order. And, and that is the world order that, that Richard Nixon very much was was part of uh, fighting for uh, that, that emerged out of World War II, uh, which uh, confirmed, again, that, that we don't change borders by fighting and, and that there is certain principles at stake. And so that's the big US interest. I think the US also has a humanitarian interest that when we see a leader of a country uh, 
indiscriminately bombing civilians, killing, the, the, the amount of suffering in Ukraine is just beyond belief. Uh, you, you see these uh, pictures of, of children and hospitals being, I mean, it's absolute savage, brutal attack by Russia against the Ukrainian people. I think that matters. Now, we have that going all over the world. Uh, I, have to, I think we have to be honest. We have those kind of uh, aggressions. But when you have it coupled with the violation of territorial integrity, and listen, that is a bit of an abstract concept. It, it is not, again, going back to land and, and, and economic power. But I do think, as the world leader of an international order that has served us very well over, since World War II, and even before, I mean, the, the notion of uh, state sovereignty predates World War II, but we've been the leader uh, in the last 90 years in terms of enforcing and, and strengthening and, and otherwise encouraging that order. We have a strong interest, and, and that is a, a more of a principled concept. It's, it's more of an abstract concept. The Ukraine isn't attacking us. Uh, so it, it's a little harder sometimes for people to understand and, and appreciate those principles, but uh, I'd say those are very much on the line. Well, I, I actually thought Congressman Royce answered this question fairly well um, in, his, in his remarks and his discussion about uh, the, the origins of World War II. Um, history doesn't repeat itself. I think it was Mark Twain or some other famous person right, uh, said, but, but it rhymes. And um, <laughs> this looks too much like that. Um, let me begin by putting this in perspective. Uh, last, in the first year of the war, the United States uh, spent uh, $46 billion in military aid um, on support for Ukraine. It's about 5.5% of the Defense Department budget. There's been some other aid as well, but, but the biggest chunk has been $46 billion from the Defense Department budget. Um, it's a little itty-bitty part of the Defense Department budget, 5.5% to push back against what is one of the two biggest threats the United States faces. Um, I'd call that a bargain, actually. Um, I, th I think we're actually getting not only good value for money, incredible value for money. The biggest thing, the biggest cost that comes in a situation like this is the dying. Um, and the Ukrainians are uh, 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 remarkably eager um, to do the dying um, if we'll supply the, the hardware. Um, and frankly, I think they're going to remain dedicated to, to doing the, the dying, whether we supply, supply the hardware or not. Um, so what's in it for us um, besides a, actually a, a bargain in terms of defense spending? Um, one of the things that I think is important that hasn't been mentioned often enough is a simple principle that says you honor your agreements. Right? Well, what agreements am I talking about? This is one of the problems, the bigger problems that, and just another cliche is if you don't know history, um, in 1994, the United States and Russia joined together to pressure Ukraine to give up its nuclear weapons. And the Ukrainians said, is this really a good idea? Look at what's next door. And basically, the US and Russia threatened, we're going to drive you into economic disaster uh, if you don't agree to give up your nuclear weapons. And the Ukrainians said, well, what about our security? The United States and Russia and the, Great Britain, uh, the United Kingdom signed a document in December of 1994 called the Budapest Memorandum that said, we will all uh, respect and guarantee your territorial integrity and sovereignty. Um, so Russia's uh, invasion first in 2014 and, and, and again in 2022 shattered that commitment. Now we've got the international law expert here. Uh, the way that agreement was written, I don't think we would say the United States is legally obligated, not that international law controls what states do, but probably not legally obligated to help, but, but the question of moral obligation is there, as well as what do future agreements, commitments from the United States look like if you violate the ones that are really important that are actually written on paper? Um, and in particular, what does the future of nuclear nonproliferation non look like if Ukraine is the example of how it works? Um, so there's some ethical issues there, and there's some real big what happens down the road issues. Um, there's also the, the broader issue of doing what's right. We have a, a powerful autocracy uh, attacking a weaker democracy. Remarkable, to get to the beginning of your question, remarkable that the party of Nixon and Reagan mm -hmm. uh, is now, it seems, led by people who think that doesn't matter. Um, but that's how this country has changed. And we just have to, we have to recognize that. Um, it's an interesting idea, right? Isolationism has a very long and broad history in this country, going back again to the 1930s. Um, but also before, 
the um, folks call themselves realists and say we should not be involved in Ukraine, um, is it realistic to think that we can let the world sort of collapse around us and that it won't affect life in the United States as we know it? Um, that the Russians are not going to try then to further interfere in our politics and so on and so forth. To me, that's not realism. Um, it's naivete. Um, so the crux of the debate comes down to US security in the narrow sense. And so let me try to say this. You, you can tell how I feel. Um, <laughs> but let me try to just be analytical, which is, which is the bigger threat? Is the bigger threat that somehow we accidentally get drawn into putting troops in Ukraine? Right? What's the threat of that happening versus the threat that somewhere down the road after Russia defeats Ukraine, we end up having to put a lot more troops into Europe, spend a lot more money on defense, and actually maybe put troops in harm's way as we did during World War II uh, because the alternative is, is, is Russia just continuing further and further west. Reasonable people can debate that. Um, I'll just tell you, I think it's pretty easy to keep troops out of Ukraine. Um, in contrast to other wars, again, the Ukrainian shortage is not in people willing to die. It's in hardware. Uh, somewhere down the road, right, after Ukraine, um, we'll have to face something else. And I'll just say, lastly, it's interesting. I, uh, I'll, I'll stop there. That's probably the best thing to do. Um, oh, source of skepticism among, among Republicans. Um, <laughs> back to Nixon and, and Reagan. I mean, this is a, this is a big change. Um, but that is one of the changes in, it's not just the Republican Party, but mostly in the Republican Party, um, is people are a lot more comfortable with authoritarianism um, than they were 30 or 40 years ago. Um, there, there are prominent people in the Republican Party who speak very favorably about Vladimir Putin. Um, and we're pretty, let's just say, not worried about the fact that he seemed to be helping him trying to win elections. Um, those are hard realities, and I don't want to get too partisan, but well, those are the issues that the country faces. We'll have a little debate on this. <laughs> uh, listen, I think that's a, a, I agree with everything you, most everything you say, and, and I, I absolutely support the policies you're advocating. I would suggest the number of pro-Putin Republicans is a distinct minority. I think they get a lot of attention. Uh, again, having said I support assisting Ukraine, I, I'm not bothered by DeSantis's comment. We're a democracy. I, I want more debate. I don't think we've had enough debate about Ukraine, frankly. Yeah, and I think the risks of escalation are real. Listen, we just had a drone incident with Russia. Mm -hmm. We've got President Xi going to Moscow next week. Uh, this, and, and also the unpredictability of war. We had the experts saying that Russia was going to be in Kyiv in a month last, mm -hmm. last March. Look how spectacularly wrong they've been. So I think any time we're discussing war, we need to be a hell of a lot more attentive to, to the details. The American people are not there, I don't think. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the polling shows that. And so I don't agree with the DeSantis comment, but uh, I want him out there. I want him talking. I want the other candidates, and, and we have other Republican candidates who are much more supportive of, of the traditional position. DeSantis and, and Trump get all the attention. But uh, having worked in Congress for, for over 20 years, we cannot debate these issues enough. And, and Congress needs to take its responsibility. We're not taking the debate seriously enough, I don't think. I'm not sure the institution, frankly, is capable of, of doing a better job. And, and I'll just close by noting uh, one, I think, positive development. Uh, I don't know if you've seen on the news lately, but the Senate moved to uh, revoke the AUMFs from Iraq and Afghanistan. So we still had AOMS, which uh, this term authorization. authorization to use the military force. Basically, it's, it's Congress's stamp of approval for, for the Iraq and, and the Afghanistan war. And those things have been out there for 20 plus years uh, for no reason other than Congress didn't want to act. And, and to me, having a little more congressional activity, a little more, little more debate uh, amongst uh, folks Again, when you have drones getting shot down by, by Russia, we shouldn't be intimidated, but we should also be pretty wide-eyed in, in terms of, of what, where this potentially could, could lead and whether the American people are prepared for that. Putin's a nuclear, Russia's a nuclear power, and he's a desperate man who will do anything to keep power. I think, it, Paul, I, I think he's motivated by land, but again, I also think he's motivated by destroying the idea that democracy ever has a chance in Russia and the way he's using Russian troops as cannon fodder and the utter 
disdain for his own people, and frankly, my surprise at how uh, conforming and, and non-protesting the Russian people have been, just seeing their sons, what, what is it, like 50,000 killed conservatively, and just seeing a dictator be able to put those kids into the cannon, cannon and shoot them out, really is, is worrying about where Russia is and, and where this could go. And so again, not, not to belabor the point, when we're dealing with a country like that, I want to be pretty, pretty cautious and, and pretty open to debate. I just want to say I completely agree. And again, not to keep on going back to the fact that Congressman Roy's covered everything in his remarks already. Um, the leadership of this country, and especially people who share the view that I do, but I'll specifically be a little bit partisan, the Biden administration has not uh, had a, elaborated the case for what's at stake for the United States, I think very effectively. Um, it's tended to say, well, of course, this is a good idea, rather than laying it out. There has been no Periclean speech. There has been no Gettysburg Address. Um, and so in that point, I completely agree that the, the, if to the extent we're going to support Ukraine, we have to understand why we're doing it and what's at stake. And, uh, and so I agree with you. All right. Um, I guess we'll move over into, uh, since you both raised issues regarding uh, nuclear escalation, we'll move over into that discussion. Um, and since we're in the Nixon Presidential Library and Museum, I decided that it would be a good idea to inject Richard Nixon um, into our discussion. Uh, in American foreign policy, uh, Nixon is known for um, the so-called madman theory of wartime diplomacy, which is essentially the idea that you make your opponent think that you might actually be mad enough to use a nuclear weapon so that they will capitulate to your demands um, at a lower cost. Um, to what extent is Putin using this kind of Nixonian approach to war fighting uh, against us? Is he bluffing when he rattles the nuclear saber? Nobody knows. <laughs> um, nobody knows. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's interesting you call it the madman theory, but there's a whole massive literature in sort of the rational theory of mm -hmm. deterrence and game theory that says it's actually very rational to pretend. Mm -hmm. And that was, and that was um, um, Nixon's point. Um, we don't know, um, and so it is worrisome. I, I have to say, he's been spectacularly successful with this um, because it comes up again and again and again. I mean, clearly, already, it's deterred the West and any number of things they might have done uh, to, to support Ukraine, most, most notably uh, attackums, um, weapons that could hit, could, uh, hit uh, Russia or parts of Crimea, which would be valuable to, to the Ukrainians. Um, the point I would simply make is that if we decide we're not willing to run some above zero risk of Russia's nuclear escalation, we should tell the Ukrainians tomorrow that we're throwing them under the bus and to make the best of it. There is no point in pushing this forward now and then sometime later decide that we don't have the stomach for it. Um, I personally think it would be irrational for Russia to use nuclear weapons um, and we could get into what would they actually accomplish on the battlefield and the answer is there's not a good, you listen to the military folks and yeah, they've been wrong about a lot but they're not always wrong about everything. Um, Actually, the, the military gains of using nuclear weapons in this conflict are pretty hard to find. So it would have to be this sort of symbolic thing. She, we mentioned she going to, to, to Moscow, right? What's she going to say to Putin about using nuclear weapons in Ukraine? So I'm not so worried about it, but I do think it is a risk that to some extent you have to run if you're going to bring this conflict to an end without capitulating. I, I don't disagree. I, I guess I, I would question, though, what he's used it well. Uh, nothing seems to have gone well for Putin militarily mm. uh, in, in Ukraine for the last year or so. Um, I know Rand came out with a study recently that, that said that they saw escalation of nuclear weapons as a possibility. Mm -hmm. And so I, to your point, Paul, I don't, I don't think we can completely rule it out, uh, so-called tactical nuclear, nuclear weapons. Uh, the world's been awful fortunate. We've only seen the use of nuclear weapons once in, in war. Um, we've had American General LeMay calling for nuclear weapons in Vietnam. I'm sure there are Russian generals mm -hmm. calling for nuclear weapons yep. in, in Ukraine today, and, and that certainly need to, to just, again, to your point, factor into the calculus. Again, I, I agree it, 
it shouldn't deter us from what we're doing, but it should be given, given consideration. I assume the Pentagon is, is thinking about all these options. Uh, the, the other final point I would make, I mean, the, the RAND study makes the point that when you have a conventional, with a Russian military decimated with a loss of tanks and armor and personnel, uh, you do get in a situation where his options, the conventional options shrink, and when that happens, then potentially it could lead to a, a tactical nuclear weapon. People don't think about nuclear weapons so much more. I remember studying them in grad school and theories of escalation. I, you can tell us about the, the academic literature on that. I, I'm dated from that. Well, I would just say briefly, there, there is an updated academic literature, and, and it has to do with the, the fact that um, new targeting technologies in, in some ways make a first strike more feasible um, than, than in the past. Um, so, so, you know, that's a, yeah, it's a, it, it's a concern. Um, it's not an easy solution for, for, um, for Putin to go to is, is what I would say. Um, but all the academic stuff, I should just say, it's all hypothetical. It's all, you know, again, sort of rational choice analysis. And, and to your point, you know, we can't always count on people to be And, and fully what rational. would a tactical strike look like? So, the, the, yeah, to get right like, down into the, 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 rea the, cold, the nasty reality of it is, so tactical nuclear weapons, you know, they have, there's very different sizes from a couple of kilotons, you know, sort of roughly the Hiroshima size or even smaller, you know, and, and up. And so it might kill all the troops and um, disable all the tanks and electronics in a, or especially killing all the troops in a, in a 600 meter radius. Right? So it's a, they're actually meant to be, they're designed to be locally, uh, have a local effect. So you could, if, you're, if some position is about to be overrun, you could use a tactical nuclear weapon to like, take out the battalion that's, that's doing that. That's one battalion in one place on the battlefield, right? And Russia invaded with something like 200 battalions. So the point is, one tactical nuclear weapon gets headlines all over the world but it only changes one fairly small part of the battlefield. So if Russia's gonna go nuclear in a way that's meant at winning the war, it's gonna have to use tens of these, not one of them, right? Now an alternative is you don't use them tactically, you use them strategically, and you, you vaporize the center of Kiev with a much bigger weapon. You could do that as well. Um, interestingly enough, right, one of the things I think we need to think about is, not only with nuclear weapons, but even with conventional weapons, that very central part of Kiev where the government resides, um, has not been bombed from, from the air with rockets yet. And I do wonder a little bit about what the Russian thinking on that is. All right. Next question. Um, how would you describe the current state of the war in Ukraine? Uh, how are the people in Ukraine, Russia, and Europe handling it? And where do you think that this is headed in the next six months to a year? Well, I think we've all been hugely impressed by the Ukrainian people and their resolve and, and their willingness to, to uh, suffer just unimaginable uh, hardship and, and death and losing their sons and e even daughters. Uh, the European response, I think, has been obviously very admirable, too, uh, both supporting Ukraine with, with arms and, and humanitarian assistance, but also welcoming a lot of Ukrainian uh, refugees. Uh, as I said before, the, the Russian, I'm not a Russian expert, but I'm just always struck when I read an article about the Russian response to, to uh, the war and, and how domestic opposition is, is virtually nil. A lot of the, a lot of the uh, Russians have left Russia who, who object to the war. And, and I think in terms of long-term consequences, you know, even a Russian victory is, is going to leave Russia a very, very weakened state with all its best people mm -hmm. fleeing the country. And, and uh, if you look at the demographics and just the economic forecasts, uh, a Russian win how do you define win? I, I think the only way Putin's defining the win is, is if Putin stays in power. Uh, so I, I, this whole, you know, 20 years ago, and, and kind of thinking back to what Ed said about hopes for, for China and, and evolving into democracy, and I remember we all had hopes for Russia after, uh, after the fall of the Soviet Union and Boris Yeltsin, and, and we had elections, and, and uh, but this really, makes you second and third think about the viability of, of democracy and rule of law, at least in the short term in Russia, given, given the, 
see the, the repression that, that Putin's exercising, and, and it seems to be working. Uh, everything I see is that domestically he's, he's not under threat by any democracy movement. Maybe the, the next general or the head of the Wagner group will, will depose him, but in terms of some type of democratic uprising, I think that's ahistorical for Russia at this point. Yeah, I, I agree with, with with all of that. I'll just add a little bit, maybe more um, detail on on opinion in Ukraine to make one point, which is we used to talk about you know pro-Russian sentiment in Ukraine, and pro-Russian sentiment in Ukraine was never about we want to secede and join Russia, right? Secessionist parties never got more than about two percent of the vote anywhere in Ukraine. Pro pro-Russian sentiment meant we want to have good trade relations with Russia. We want to be able to cross the border easily and without a visa. Um, and we want to sort of um, have relations both with Russia and with the West. That sentiment is, is now gone in Ukraine. One of the major disasters that Putin has created for Russian policy is he has, for after all these years of saying Ukraine and, and, and Russia are really one, one and the same people, there's not a single person in Ukraine now who believes that anymore. Now, Russians are Ukrainians' mortal enemies. The sort of the, the, um, the nationally defining factor of Ukrainians now is we're the people at war with Russia. And so in a strange sort of way, that actually I think is going to force you, Russia to be more aggressive and more brutal in this war because it's no longer the case that when they take over some of these places, there's going to be a whole bunch of people eager to collaborate with them or willing to collaborate with them. It, they're going to the, the, um, um, the repression, um, depopulation that's going, that will, will follow wherever, wherever Russia takes over is going to be substantial. And I think this has implications for not only what happens if Russia conquers Ukraine, um, but for Ukrainian-Russian relations for the next 100 years. OK, well, I have one last question, and then we can uh, open it up for Q&A. Um, beyond Europe, how is the rest of the world viewing this conflict? Uh, it hasn't been encouraging. <laughs> As uh, the chairman said, we do a lot of work in Africa, and if you look at a lot of African countries, they, they did, most of them voted to, to uh, condemn the, Rus the uh, Russian aggression, but, but many didn't. And I think that reflects the, the power side of the equation. Of, we, we talk about power and, and principle. Principle being we care about things like territorial integrity and, and uh, not trying to conquer land by, by military invasion. Um, some, some countries care about those norms, uh, others don't. Uh, and if you look at Africa, Russia has done a very good job cultivating relationships with, with non-democratic governments based on, on the power, based on uh, uh, also China as well, but payoffs and, and uh, a lot of governments don't want, you know, see these principles as is not particularly relevant to, to what they're trying to achieve. And if they have a relationship with Russia that's beneficial in some way, or a relationship with China that's beneficial, that's going to supersede their, their concerns about uh, the, the international system as, as we understand it, as we're trying to protect it. And so it's a real battle. And, and we, we see that again playing out in Africa, uh, but really all over the world. And, and uh, there's another reality is that a lot of African governments don't view, you know, they got a lot of other problems. Uh, they've got development problems, they've got uh, conflicts, uh, and they haven't necessarily viewed the international system as, as well serving their interests. Uh, and again, the, the Chinese and, and Russian systematic attempts to manipulate and undermine U.S. interests, U.S. values through, through social media, through uh, misinformation, uh, we need to be engaged in, in the developing world, and, and we're not. Uh, we're, we're certainly not in the way that China has been over the last 20 years with the Belt and Road Initiative that, that was mentioned earlier. We just need to work a, a whole lot harder if, if we're going to have countries view the conflict the way that uh, the way uh, that we view it. So. Yeah. I, again, I, I agree. There's there's a lot of people in a lot of different regions, and and you know I've been talking to people in lots of different countries in lots of different parts of the world, um, who in one way or another think of the United States as an imperialist country. And we can get into the historical accuracy of that or whatever, but, but that's the reality of the sentiment. And, and um, we have to recognize that it's there whether we agree with it or not. It's also the case that a lot of leaders in a lot of those countries 
Um, and one of the reasons why they maybe think of us as imperialists is we say things like, man, maybe you shouldn't be so corrupt. And so, again, there's a, a, a greater level of comfort in some places with the kinds of questions the Russians and Chinese ask and don't ask and the kinds of things they do and don't do than there is with, with what the United States has been doing, especially post-Cold War when we've put a lot more emphasis on whether the countries we supported were uh, democratic. Right Back in the good old days of the Cold War, uh, you know, there were some different, some, some different ideas about that. Um, one thing we haven't mentioned yet, but I think this actually connects attitudes around the world with a lot of the isolationism we see in this country right now is it's 20 years this, this week or this month uh, since the United States started the, the war in Iraq. Um, and I think that's had an effect very much on US uh, domestic attitude towards intervention overseas. And it's had a huge effect on attitudes around the world. It certainly has had a big effect in Russia. It's one of the things that, that Putin continues to talk about is this idea of who are you to talk about international law? Who are you to talk about respecting borders and so on? And so again, I, we don't have to agree with those interpretations of history, but I think we should recognize that those kinds of ideas um, shape a lot of thinking again, I think both inside this country and elsewhere. If I, I, I agree. If I could just add though, uh, in, in terms of I mentioned Africa, a lot of these relationships are built just with the government, and it doesn't yeah. necessarily yeah. reflect the attitudes of the African people. And so they do some pretty good polling of, of uh, Africa, a company called Afrobarometer. And generally, African sentiments still are very much pro-American. Uh, if you look at our cultural, yeah. the cultural affinities uh, between the United States and African countries, it's so much stronger. And Marie, you were very much involved in fostering a lot of those relationships. But if you ask an African, do you want to go to the US or you want to go to China, it, 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 there's, or Russia, there, there's no, no uh, question about that. And so we, we do have a lot of power and a lot of the, the attitudes that we're seeing. And so for example, South Africa, unfortunately, has gotten very close to Russia and China and did a recent uh, military ex joint military exercise with them. Uh, that is definitely a, a result of many decades of strong cultivation by those two governments of the African, Afri African National Congress. Not the South African people, but a certain political party that was Marxist in its origins. And so I, I agree, but we just have to be cautious, I think, a little bit about whose, whose opinions are being reflected. And, and again, to uh, Ed's point, we need to do a better job at explaining American positions, and not just American positions, Western opinions. I mean, how can you not condemn an, uh, an evasion that leads to the death and destruction and bombing and human suffering that Russia's unleashed? But we're not getting that message out particularly well. And so we have a lot more work to do uh, with, with African publics and South American publics. But it, ta it takes a lot of effort. And uh, frankly, we don't always value diplomacy and, and in our country, we, we don't put enough effort into it. Uh, we need to be doing a lot more uh, if, if we're going to expect the world to look at at these conflicts through through the prism we'd like them to look through, look at it through. Yeah. I would just I would just uh, add if and if we as a country embrace a new era of isolationism, all those things you just talked about are going to get worse, not better. All right, well, in the time that we have left, um, go ahead and open it up for questions. Yes? Do we really know how much the Russian people are really opposing Putin? Do we really know that? Is that, is that kind of I can talk to that. The Russian people opposing Putin? Um, so there is polling in Russia. The leading polling center, the Levada Institute, has now been declared a foreign agent. Um, they're, all, they're also, they, um, <laughs> but, they're, but they try to do good work despite the limitations on them. Um, so they, for example, you can't ask people's attitude towards the war because it's not a war. It's a special military, you can't. So what you have to ask is, um, what's the, the, the proxy the pollsters use is what's your attitude towards the Russian military? And, and they've tracked that. Um, and, and basically, the Russian people, to the best, with all the caveats on, on are they going to tell the truth about how they feel, all the information we have says the vast majority of the Russian people um, are either um, sort of lukewarm or just keeping their heads down. Um, there's a small contingent who are absolutely gung-ho about this war, and there are some that are against it who are either keeping their mouth shut or who have left the country. But even if you go to Georgia, where a lot of them have gone, 
I've seen uh, people that have done a lot of interviews among the Russian immigrants in Georgia. Um, it's not clear that they left because they opposed the war. They mm -hmm. left because they don't want to participate in it, right? Mm -hmm. It's not the same thing. I, I don't think, let me say, I don't think there's any reasonable way we can count on the Russian people to stop this war. I'll, I'll address two aspects of that. And I, I couldn't agree with you more. The, the State Department needs to be empowered. It, it is not a key player at many of these discussions. Uh, all due respect, Maria, <laughs> I don't know how you'd feel about that. But uh, uh, too often it is not, you know, people think of the State Department, the diplomats, they're at the lead of, of policy issues of resolving conflicts or so forth. The, the DOD just has so many more resources and uh, the you know, State Department has, has a lot of internal problems. It, it needs, to be, needs to be empowered. In terms of, I, I think your point's a, a very good one about um, the difference between war in Ukraine and, and war in Iraq and Afghanistan and the whole nation building concept. I mean, I, we shouldn't fool ourselves. Uh, Ukraine has been destroyed and it's gonna take, take a lot of effort to, to rebuild, but that is different fundamentally. And, and to Paul's point about President Biden hasn't done a good job explaining what the stakes are. I think to, if he were to take that line of argument and, and start making that nuance, because you're right, there is just people look back at uh, Afghanistan and Iraq and just that is driving part some of the opposition to engaging in, in Ukraine. My gosh, we, we were at that for 20 years and it, where did it lead? So I think that nuanced under explanation about uh, where Ukraine was and, and what it could be uh, might help. Uh... Yeah, I, I'll just respond to a different part of that because I agree with all of that. Um, and I don't know enough about the interagency process and, and a congressional commission really to speak intelligently about that, so I apologize. Um, but about response to the use of weapons of mass destruction. The United States actually, um, and, and NATO, but really the United States, has a lot of things it can do in response to uh, Russian uh, use of, of nuclear weapons. At the time, this really got to be a big deal last fall when people were talking about it a lot. David Petraeus, the former general and director of Central Intelligence and now commentator on things, um, you know, said, here's what we would do. And I, I always want, he said, he said um, look, we could use our weapons, our conventional weapons, to take out every ship in the Black Sea Fleet, right? To take out every Russian military unit in Ukraine. Um, his point being, we got a ton of conventional hardware that we have not put on the table yet. Um, not only not giving it to the Ukraine, Ukrainians, but of course we have our own conventional forces. And I have wondered at the time, it's like, okay, he, he um, does not work for the U.S. government at this point. I wondered whether he 
was, whether that was a deliberate arm's length, somebody in the United States government said to him, hey, why don't you go say this? Uh, I'm guessing not. But my point is, we actually have a lot of effective ways of deterring uh, Russian uh, nuclear first use. Oh, he wants to argue. You have an established policy that we need to dissolve. When you have no policy, since Klausowitz yep. said we are Klausowitz here still, <laughs> the war is simply policy by other means. Yep. The government setting these policies, yep. the enemy doesn't know what to expect from us, and we do not act definitely or quickly enough in response to dire threats. Take 9-11 as an example for Pearl Harbor. So my point is, again, reforming the interagency so that it actually proposes options for the president to enable the president's decision-making and to allow Congress to do its job would be something that the Congress can do but may not know it can do because it's been so long since Cold War and Nichols. No one is thinking that way. But that's the way to reform our whole approach to the four instruments I mentioned. Yeah. Hold on one second, I've got a mic. Hold on. Oh. First. Just real quick questions. Um, Can Ukraine win the war? How would that come about? And what would a post war world look like? <laughs> yeah. That's the problem, is it took 10 seconds to say those questions. <laughs> it takes six days to answer them. Can it win? Depends on how we define win, and that's been a problem. Um, the Ukrainians have a sense of what it means to win, but, but the United States does not. Um, what was the second one? How? how? Yeah, I think, um, I think the how is by defeating Russian troops in the field, right? And, and, and to get back to the first question, the big question is, um, do you define winning as regaining all of Ukraine's territory uh, circa, 19, circa, pre, circa 2014 or 2022 or something else? Um, but to connect the first question to the third, it, you could define a win for Ukraine as a post-war Ukraine that might not have the same territorial footprint, but has a high degree of security and prosperity going forward. Uh, so this has been sometimes called the South Korea scenario, right? Where, well, South Korea still is kind of in this rotten situation with North Korea, but guess what? It's a wealthy, prosperous, democratic society. Um, that is going to require a big financial and security commitment on the part of NATO. And one of the things that just to be, try to be brief, is there's a connection between what the Ukrainians will be willing to concede on the battlefield and what NATO is willing to promise Ukraine in terms of post-war security. The Ukrainians aren't going to give up territory unless they get security guarantees from the West, and they have to be better than the ones they got in 1994. I, if I could just add. I don't see a scenario, any kind of diplomatic resolution of this conflict. I don't see Putin willing to play that game. I think it'd be very hard to see Ukraine. I see it more as a frozen conflict uh, that we see in Georgia and elsewhere, where there's a, essentially an end to fighting, but there's no resolution of, of territory or, or any type of formal agreement. I, I don't know how I feel about extending defense guarantees to, right. to Ukraine. I don't think the American people are there. I think we need to have a m much more of a debate about that. I don't think Europe, the other NATO countries would necessarily be eager to sign up on that. But I agree with you, it, it would be probably the best way to, to end this on, on good terms. But uh, it's, uh, we had a debate about Georgia and, and uh, when the chairman was in Congress, uh, a lot of members were calling for extending NATO to Georgia, and, and I think he expressed some concerns about that. I, I just think extending NATO to a to those countries just we, we have to look at not not to well we have to look at our national interest and what the American people are willing to do, and they're not willing to. My son's in the Marine Corps. He, he's he's in Tao, he's in Okinawa right now. If we were in Europe, I, I could not support him going to Georgia to fight for. For Georgia, Just, so we, we need those debates. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. But but if 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 there's a post-war world in which the conflict is frozen, but there's no real agreement, and the United States and NATO don't continue to arm and support Ukraine, Russia will rearm and just conquer Ukraine. I mean, I think it would be. You talk about being realistic. There's no way they're not going to. We have been talking about Russia and Ukraine, mm -hmm. but uh, 
Let me give you another scenario based on the wonderful maps. You know, the Congressman Royce presented this morning. If we go back to the 30s and the 40s, right, the Second World War, mm -hmm. it was a small country, landlocked, mm -hmm. Germany, mm -hmm. with not self-sufficient at all, and, and materials like uh, fuel, you know, mat uh, raw iron and etc. Right, and we had uh, Japan that they considered to be a war superpower, which was not. Right? But now, what if is Russia, uh, China, and um, North Korea most likely, right, and potentially India? What if they do get involved? And now we have to face similar war, right? But with different players, one. Second, you know, after the Second World War, we expanded and we became imperialists pretty much around the country, around the world, as branding, okay? I can tell you coming from Mexico <laughs> and dealing with students, I teach at UCLA and Loyola Marymount, right? Global Marketing and Strategy. And I mean, that's the way we are looking at, even now, okay? Uh, at that time, we became imperialists because we were dictating because we produce the products and we give them the term, the money, through the IMF, as the Wilson you know, trade agreement. So if, okay, China replaces enough of the economic needs, right, for exports, because China has a big problem, as you know. China doesn't have enough uh, production capacity to satisfy both the domestic and the international demands for products and services. So if they say the hell with the international part, except with the Asian, including Australia now, they can substitute all this. So should we also change, you know, question number two, should we change our branding approach for imperialists to what uh, Congressman Roy said this morning, right? Eco, econo, right? Oh, oh sorry, <laughs> had my mind. E uh, econo, global, you know? Eco, yeah. eco, thank you. Eco, eco global, you know. I, I, I think the, uh, it's, very, it's a very good point you make about branding. I, I'm not sure I agree that we've been an imperialist country. Uh, we've got we've got countries all over. We've got countries all over the world asking us uh, to have military relationships, whether it be Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, Europe. Uh, we, the imperialist right now is Vladimir Putin. Yeah, I. Uh, yeah, we could, there's a lot of different situations, right? The Ukrainians are begging us to come in. The Taiwanese are deeply interested in, in us being there and helping. The Japanese and so on. So we need to distinguish what's imperialism and what's not imperialism. And to your point, the, the Russians, uh, more than anybody right now, are going where they're not loved. And I'll just say one of the things I say to my friends around the world when they sort of complain about American hegemony is, well, okay, you don't, you don't like American hegemony, fair enough. How are you gonna like Russian hegemony or Chinese hegemony? And they all give me this look like, oh, I haven't thought about that. Well, that's what's coming if somebody <laughs> doesn't do something and it won't be pretty. Okay, we, we've got... <laughs> I know, I know you're not advocating Chinese hegemony. Yeah. We've, we've got time for about two more questions that need to be brief and questions. <laughs> yes. Uh, very brief question. Nixon played a long shot and, uh, you know, let China play a role in the uh, Cold War process, which resulted in the uh, dissolve the dissolution of uh, USSR. Mm -hmm. Now, Xi Jinping is going to Russia, Moscow, next week. Uh, what do you think of the role of Xi Jinping or China in terms of mediating this conflict, according to the media reports sometimes you see? Thank you. I would love to see it. I'm much more interested in the conflict ending than I am in whatever concern the U.S. government might have about that little bit of increasing role uh, for China. And in fact, I think one of the best things that could happen in the world is that China would come to see itself not as a disruptor, uh, but as a solver of problems. If there's going to be hope for a not really nasty future, that would actually be a good thing. Okay, this is a speed round. Hold on. Uh, quick question, uh, Mr. Xi, you re uh, responded a few minutes ago about uh, approximately 50,000 troops. Uh, mm -hmm. Wall Street Journal reported that Russia has lost somewhere between 180 to 200,000 troops over the last 12 months. Uh, how accurate is that? 
And uh, I, I guess, based on everything that people are asking right now, my question is how rapidly, and you, you alluded to it a few minutes ago, how rapidly does the uh, Russian government, are, are they capable of replenishing their military supply? It, from all appearances, it looks like we're fighting a proxy war here where basically we're allowing them to expend their resources. And does Russia approach a, a certain point where they can't come back from this and really be a, a, a viable uh, superpower uh, going forward? So what are your feelings on that? No, you're right. The estimates on, on killed in action, I have what I've seen have varied quite considerably from 20,000 to 200,000. I, I think the head of British intelligence had, had quite a high figure there, uh, maybe upwards of, of 200,000 killed and wounded. Uh, from what I read, see, uh, I do think there is a possibility that the Russian military just exhausts itself, and I think that's in part why you're seeing them build relationships with Iran and in North Korea and in China to replenish the the armory. Um, I don't know what their industrial capacity is to to build more tanks and. It, yeah, on, on tanks in particular, it, it's going to take a long time. They they've got to do a whole sort of defense reconversion project. Um, in terms of in terms of soldiers, it's like this is where pub, Russian public opinion matters, because if you think about it, two hundred thousand dead, that's a lot of dead. But but in the context of the Russian population. Think about the kind of sacrifices they endured in World War II. 200,000 is a percent, right? Um, but can they mobilize those people within the sort of political situation that they're trying to maintain? And, and this is where we see Putin actually being incredibly cautious, which is in trying to run this war without the average Russian having to really think about it. And, and so that's the limit right now, is not the actual number of bodies in Russia, but the, but the government's willingness to do what it takes to mobilize them into the army and to deal with the consequences. And so, so in one sense, they'll be able to replenish the army once this ends, right? Um, but in a political sense, continuing to do what they're doing is going to be very hard in terms of manpower. They're trying all sorts of, I want to say crazy, <clears throat> all sorts of very unconventional things to try to get more bodies into the battlefield. Okay, we got a question here. Uh, do you think uh, the main reason for this war, uh, you, uh, when Ukraine when Ukraine asked NATO to join them, do you think if uh, Ukraine right now announced uh, it will be neutral in this war in, uh, between NATO and Russia, do you think this war will end? Do I think if Ukraine would pledge its neutrality, the war would end? Yes. No. I, I have been one of those and written 200 pages about it. This war is not about Ukraine, about Ukraine's relationship with NATO. It's, it's not. Um, and in fact, um, in the months before the war started and in the weeks after the war started, Zelensky sort of said publicly, maybe we have to give up on the idea of NATO membership. It had no effect on anything. Um, that's a short version. <laughs> Don't get me started. I see, <laughs> I see two hands, one here and one in the back. I, I think that NATO should promote the Catholics and the Pope to bring peace between Russia and Ukraine. There we go. Is that a question? <laughs> and, and the question is, is, why is NATO not doing that? <laughs> I don't think there's a, a clear sense that the, the Roman Catholic Church has uh, the resources or ability or even um, sufficient prestige to bring the two sides together. Um, there's a substantial popul uh, Catholic population in Ukraine. Not, Russia's an almost exclusively Orthodox and Muslim country. Um, so it's just not, not clear that the, that the, the Pope has the political clout to, to get anybody to do anything. Nor does, nor does the Pope necessarily have the perception of neutrality um, to get both sides involved. So, you know, as Stalin famously said, I think it was Stalin, right? Yeah. How many divisions does the Pope have? <laughs> okay. Um, so I think uh, I don't need to introduce myself, but I will. My name is Lavanya Garg. I'm a Fullerton College student. 
um, community college student, by the way, um, assuming that every single person in this room is an immigrant because Jamestown failed, what should we do considering the triple P, of, not GDP, triple PPP of the countries involved in the war, which we call a war, what do we do diplomatically about the Eastern allies and leaders, including Prime Minister Modi, who are silent regarding what is happening between Russia and Ukraine? Should we make a move and get on a jet and talk to them? Or should we stay silent and let it happen like we did with World War I and II? Hmm. Um, th th this goes to the, the point about just how different countries perceive the conflict. And, and uh, I don't know that uh, badgering will, will really have that much of an impact, to be honest. I, I, I don't know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> for Prime Minister Modi to come to the U.S.? No, for the U.S. to go to Prime Minister Modi. Sorry, for the U.S. to go to Prime Minister Modi as an invitation because the Secretary of State was going to go to China. Just saying. Yeah, uh, India has all kinds of its calculation. It's it is, and, and uh, we have to recognize the chairman, chairman's work uh, for 25 years in improving U.S. relations with India. Uh, it still can be a pretty frustrating experience in terms of Indian alignment. Uh, they still, I, I did read that they're one of the, uh, and I guess this gets back to the point about the Russian military, Russian arms sales are, are way down the last couple of years. Uh, India has always been the biggest consumer of Ru Russian uh, military hardware, and and that's shifting uh, to the U.S. And, and others. So hopefully that was always put forth as one of the big reasons why India was, was somewhat pro-Russia uh, because of the military relationship. And then obviously of China uh, in, in the border conflict between India and China. So I, I'm always for more diplomacy and, and more interaction. I, I, getting back to the point, I think absolutely more U.S. officials need to get to Africa. And I, I commend President Biden for for announcing he's going to Africa this year, and hopefully these can be, be conversations. But again, it, it's the principle, and, and I don't know that you go and, and you convince India that uh, integral principles on the line here in, in Ukraine, and they're gonna change their tune. I, I wish that were so, but I think if, if it were, it already would have happened. Yeah, I, just, I think we have to believe, right, that there are very senior people in the State Department um, talking to their colleagues, in, in India. Um, the State Department does its job pretty well, actually. Um, they, it may not be at the point where, where anybody's ready for, for that invitation. The, the, um, India is a democracy, less so than it used to be. Um, and Modi has a lot to do with that. Um, but it has its own interests. Um, its biggest problem is Pakistan. And guess who sold tanks to Pakistan? Ukraine. Um, you know, so, so we can't expect India to not follow what it sees as its interests. It's in a tough neighborhood. It borders both Pakistan and China. Um, and of course, there's its history as in uh, perceiving itself as an anti-imperialist state and so on. And, um, and Modi's perception of his domestic political interests. We can do hopefully a lot, and I hope we're trying really hard to bring India and the Indian government on board. But we can't. You know, but they have their own interests, and we have to respect that as, and acknowledge that as well. We had a small victory on the India front. After 500 days, we finally got a U.S. ambassador confirmed to India, <laughs> fellow <laughs> Californian. And, and so to the point of dysfunction, dipl diplomatic dysfunction for the U.S., finally, I think he was confirmed this week. Uh, and, and so we've got a question here. It's been reported that uh, Poland is going to send some big... 29s to Ukraine. Do you see that as a significant uh, challenge for the rest of NATO in terms of not giving more advanced weaponry to Ukraine? And how do you think Russia is going to view that? The numbers so far are pretty small, but, uh, but of course it's another sort of barrier breach. You know, one of the things that I think the Ukrainians are frustrated with is they were asking for this in the summer, spring and summer of 2022. Right? And there was this enormous debate uh, within NATO, and finally, and, and nobody could seem to manage to get it done. And now this week, Poland just says, we're doing it. 
Um, so, so it is, you know, that line, that famous Churchill line about the United States, they always do the right thing once all the alternatives are exhausted. Um, <laughs> I think the Ukrainians feel that way about, about some of their NATO allies. Um, but it does open up that, and I believe now one of the Baltic states said that they're going to send some as well. I forgot which country it was. Oh, Slovakia, not a Baltic state, sorry. Um, it matters. Their powerful uh, air power is crucial, especially in any, if there's going to be any Ukrainian counteroffensive, um, air power will be a huge part of that. You know, the numbers are fairly small, and jet fighters get shot down when they actually, uh, when you don't have air, uh, total, total air, air supremacy. So we'll see. The Russians said we're going to shoot them down, and my guess is some of them will. Dr. Traven, are we, uh, we're, we're kind of at the end. Is there a wrap-up you plan? A discussion of the, the panel, wrap up what they talked oh. about? Or? I would just say, I think it's been um, a, a great discussion. These are really tough issues, as I think all of the questions have, have, um, have, have, have indicated. It's, um, to get back to what I said at the beginning, it's the most precarious time in European security, you know, I would argue since 1939 or maybe since 1961, the last of the big Berlin crises. Um, who knows where this is going to go? I would just uh, get back to Ed Royce's presentation and his discussion of Taiwan. I don't think that really quite came out in our conversation here, but I think it's very important for us to think about China's perceptions of the Ukrainian conflict and how that impacts their calculus in terms of moving against Taiwan. Uh, that is the, the principle that I, I spoke of, of non-aggression uh, non and territorial integrity, and if, if that's fundamentally eroded or eroded in, in Ukraine, sends a very bad signal, I think, to Beijing. All right. Let's give a hand to the, to the panel.